to tonight's program. Um, want to give a special thank you to our members who are here tonight. You absolutely could have been anywhere in the world, literally thanks to Zoom, um, but you're here with us this evening and we are happy to have you. Um, I am coming to you live from my living room in Northeast DC. However, the physical building of the Phillips Collection sits on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. And we would like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present. Um, this acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, of the continued existence of indigenous and other peoples, and of our museum's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who still call these lands home today. Um, we certainly recognize that land acknowledgements like these are a small step, um, but they are a step and we are committed to this work. Um, my name is Erica Harper. I am head of pre-K-12 initiatives here at the Phillips Collection um, and happy to have you all here tonight. I am a brown skinned black woman um, with blonde hair, some dark roots. Uh, I'm sitting in front of my very messy bookcase um, and my famous red walls uh, and a white door. This talk tonight was inspired by a work of art that is in our current exhibition, Rifts and Relations, African-American Artists and the European Modernist Tradition. Um, this exhibition was the brainchild of Dr. Adrian Childs, um, who is the first Black curator in the nearly 100 year history of the Phillips Collection, um, which is a very significant and important uh, moment for us. Uh, this exhibition is on view until January 3rd. So if you're out in these streets and you wanna physically see it, you can go to our museum, get, go online to get you some time tickets. But if you're hunkering down like some of us, you can also check out the exhibition online. I'd also like to acknowledge our in-house curator, Renee Maurer, who collaborated with Adrian on this exhibition. Uh, we will have a little time at the end for a short Q&A. So you can put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A section and we will get to as many of those as we can um, this evening. So I think that's all of sort of my housekeeping that I have to do. So my one job tonight is just to introduce the two gentlemen um, who are gonna be talking. And, you know, I thought a lot about how to introduce them. They both have really long resumes. They are um, well-degreed and highly awarded. So we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time uh, read, reading their resumes to you, but there are some things that I wanna tell you about the two of them. Um, I think that we live in a world where uh, we like to make men into gods and, you know, some men like to deify themselves. And one thing that I appreciate and respect about these two gentlemen who are going to be in conversation tonight is they have lots of reason to be pretty arrogant uh, about themselves and yet somehow they remain um, incredibly humble and down to earth. So I'm just gonna share some really regular facts about them um, with you guys. So Bamani Jones is a writer. Uh, he's a journalist, a music critic, a TV and radio personality. Uh, by education, he's an economist. Uh, he is an HBCU alum. He is a Southerner. Uh, he's also a son, a nephew, and a little brother. Hank Willis Thomas is an artist. He's a photographer and a sculptor. He is an activist. Uh, he's a visionary and a truth teller. Some would say he's an agitator. Uh, he is a Yankee. He's a son, a cousin. He's a father and a husband, um, and he is an only child. Uh, some of us know Hank affectionately by his superhero name. So Bomani and Hank, if you guys would humor me a little bit, Hank, I'd love for you to start by just telling the people your superhero name um, and maybe help Bomani along to choose his own this evening. And so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Bomani Jones and Hank Willis Thomas. Thank you so much for those incredible introductions. So yeah, my uh, we all have uh, many names that we go by, but uh, I was given the name Mr. Beautiful by a little stranger. And they told me, another stranger told me that uh, my name is Mr. Beautiful because I see the beauty in everything and everyone. And uh, I was really quite um, <laughs> struck by what was so obvious to a total stranger that uh, took a long time for me to understand. This is Zen Z. 
who's uh, also contributing to this conversation. So, Bomani, do you has, do you have other names that you go by? I mean, I feel like my name is Bomani Jones. That kind of sums it up right then and there. <laughs> I was going to say, like, the superhero name, uh, that, that, that might have been where my start is. And I'm glad that you introduced the real superhero here, because I get the feeling that the star of this show is sitting right there with her top of her head right there at your chin. And your middle name is it? Is it Babatunde? Babatunde, that is correct. Yeah. Did, so what yeah. do those names mean to you? Uh, Bomani means warrior in a handful of different languages. And Babatunde is actually a fairly common West African name. It means return of the father. So I was the first child born after my grandfather died, which is where you typically get Babatundes come up in the family. It's actually interesting because we lived in Nigeria for a year when I was younger, but that name gives the impression that I am far more African than I actually am. So I wind up in situations where I have to be like, hey, hey my brother, my brother, I appreciate it and demonstrate a level of solidarity, but we are not quite as solidaritarized as the name might indicate. My parents are just adventurous um, in that sorts of way. Now, now, how old is NZ? All right, I think I lost audio. Uh, NZ is 20 months. 20 months, all right. Well, one thing I saw um, in getting ready for this that I wanted to ask you about is something that you and I have in common is kind of being the children um, of academics, which I know I say on my end has always been a great advantage that I've had just in terms of exposure. And apparently like the way I grew up at my mom's office, you grew up at your mom's office, except her office was the Schomburg. Exactly, the Schomburg and then also um, the National Museum of African-American Wait, what was it called then? The National the African American Museum Project, which is now that the Museum of Zanzi. I'm speaking, my love. The National African American Museum, uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. So my mother, um, throughout my entire childhood and throughout my entire uh, adult, young, young adulthood, was um, in archives. And that was really an incredible place to grow up. Right. Did you have a moment, though, where you realized, like, I didn't realize until I first got to college, like the advantage that I had had just in terms of exposure where everybody else is brand new to college and I've been there forever. Like, does you ever have a moment where you looked up and realized that, like, oh, man, like this has prepared me for where I'm ultimately going to end up? I think Hank's still on the mute. I didn't really think about that until graduate school. And it was because I thought that I got to graduate school on my own merit. And then I got there and everyone was like, oh, so you're Deb's son. I was like, wait. I like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that everywhere I would go, uh, my mother had already been and sometimes had recently just left because she has a crazy um, speaking to our schedule, which uh, many people also can attest to. I remember I had a moment, this was right after I graduated, went to some graduation party and I saw a professor who I didn't even take a class from and I was with my dad and I just remember I said, hey, uh, did you know this is my father? And she looked at me and laughed in my face and kept walking. Like I thought I had been existed on the slick and nobody had any idea who I was, right? I was just walking around, you know, ordinary student, right? Like that's what I thought I was. And I told that woman that she laughed directly in my face. Like it's always interesting that when you have these sorts of associations, it's cool when your parents put you in a place where you can like exist as yourself, but you don't realize how many people are just being kind enough to play along while you're doing that. Yeah, well, my father always said, it's not how you get, to get through the door, it's you know, what you do when you get there. But I think for a long time, I tried to figure out how to define myself separately from my mother. And then I realized that literally, you know, she made me. <laughs> so there was no benefit. <laughs> to me uh, trying to think about who I am independently because she she's always has been, always will be a part of me. So right. I, I embrace that and have still not filled her shoes. And so that's, uh, that's, that's and, and I don't intend to. <laughs> well, one thing I also wanted to ask you is I now live in Harlem, the Sean Burge is a few blocks away from where I live, you know, where I live right now. But for you, like the influence of Harlem itself on your life and your work, is there something, anything in particular that you would like point to when you say like, okay, this is where the place I'm from, this is how it made me? Well, I grew up on the Upper West Side okay. and uh, although it's only 40 blocks from the Schomburg where I grew up, 
um, I had a very, I had this experience, you know, going to a relatively integrated, mixed um, junior high schools and elementary school, and then, you know, every day after school, going straight to Harlem, and Harlem was more uh, um, of a very much a chocolate city neighborhood, uh, and uh, then, and I didn't know, I can't even say I was actually that aware of the difference, but now <laughs> that it is so striking <laughs> um, when I go to Harlem and, and I don't recognize certain things and definitely the, the, the community has become more diverse through gentrification. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, actually what things I might've missed from the cultural experience when I was a youth that like, you know, that, um, that because now you see the Schomburg, you're like the Schomburg Center for Research of Black Culture, is it gonna soon be an island <laughs> in the middle of, you know, a gentrified community? Can, can it still maintain, uh, and like with the County Cullen Library, you know, um, Abyssinian Baptist Church, um, these kind of, institutions in Harlem that, that supported and uplifted the African-American community for so long um, are becoming lonelier. Yeah, one thing I do always say that is interesting is I am in measure somewhat curious about what Harlem was before I got here, because when people talk about how it is not as black as it was before, this is still the blackest place in the world to me. Like I see people like the farther west you go, I see the difference on it, but I go outside. I'm like, so exactly how black was this before you oh, it was, got here? Yes, you saw New Jack City. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, and I, for me, I think being able to navigate multiple cultural communities has always been a benefit. I think there's something to be said uh, for the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance, you know, the energy that was uh, created and cultivated through, um, you know, black excellence in spite of uh, degradation and, and segregation. And um, that, yeah, now, because I live in Brooklyn, right? And um, Harlem's for strivers still. And I think that's what you see, you know, I think you see uh, that that form of black excellence still. I, um, but there was also like another thing, you know, that, that I can say that I remember. All right, now I wanna get to a couple of things that we've got here. Now we are dealing with me and my assumption that I can make this technology work in the right way. So if all you told is, <laughs> give me just one second. I think we're all right here. Hello, 161 people. Yeah, I was gonna say we got we got a little we got a turnout. I'll take that. Um, while while you're talking, yeah, I, mean, I also had the privilege of of going to high school at Duke Ellington School of Arts in, in DC, um, and going from from my experience going from New York to going to DC back then in the 90s, it was also going from what I thought was a black neighborhood community to like another version of it, you know, and it was really fascinating to see kind of what a true chocolate city was like and also where the Southern meets um, the government meets um, the incredible history of, of, you know, Georgetown and uh, Anacostia and I, I I was talking to someone else from DC the, the, today and they were also remarking um, about how dramatically different it is and how the urbanization of it and the gentrification of it has also kind of changed the face and, and, and to the place where she was like, it feels like I've landed on Mars. And, and I think, I wonder if it, that just means you're old. <laughs> you know, you're like, stuff has changed and I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> No, I totally understand. Now, Eric has luckily got us up here on the presentation. There's a couple of words about Jacob Lawrence that we have here that you have spoken on and the inspiration they had on you. And I was wondering if you could just discuss that a little bit. Yeah, it's, that's, it speaks exactly to it. So when I, in 1992, um, I was actually, I believe, 
in the Phillips collection. I was at, I went to Duke Ellington School for the Arts and I was in the Museum Studies program, which was the laughing stock of any arts high school because, you know, like, what do you do in Museum Studies? It also um, was the place where I learned critical thinking and where we, at, in high school, were looking at museum archives and in the libraries and the stacks and actually, uh, uh, Jacob Lawrence uh, came into, walked into the, the building while, I, while we were there as students and we got to meet him briefly. Um, that was also the time when um, the, the, my, the migration series was first reunited. Um, he, I think Finn finished the series in the mid 1940s and there are, I should know this, 44 paintings, someone will put them in the chat. <laughs> and ha and the even numbers, I believe, are at the, at the Phillips Collection, the odd numbers went to MoMA Collection. And they hadn't been reunited in 50 years. And uh, that was the first time that I actually really saw the power of art as a tool for storytelling. There's 60. Um, and because it told a very critical part of the African-American experience uh, through an artist's lens using very little words in very basic forms and, and, and colors, yet so much expression. And being in DC, the Chocolate City, and being in and growing up in Philadelphia and New York, where I, and having all, I never understood actually until that moment, why so many of my relatives were still down South. And, the, and, and realizing that we, literally were manifestations of our ancestors' dreams, being in the North, having some of the opportunities we have, being able to go to different colleges and teach, uh, and have our parents teach at colleges. And um, that would just change my life forever. And so I, I've made several series inspired by it. You know, that is one of the more under-discussed eras of American history. Like I remember when I read The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkinson when it came out and uh, the recommendation of my father that it was the best book that he had ever read, which seemed like an impossible sort of situation. But like as I got in and read about it, there was something noble in the majesty of the idea. And it's something that black people, at least in the telling of American history, really hadn't been participatory in, which is the idea that whereas we did not immigrate to this country, we immigrated within this country. And so the whole story of like packing up and going to something better and everything that you went through in order to do that is a part of Americana that we had kind of been excluded from because of the, the great migration was not contextualized in that same way in part because explaining why those people had to migrate is one thing to say that people left persecution from another land. It's another thing to say that people left persecution um, within that same land. And it is, particularly when we start looking at what the 1960s and 70s were, like hey, Curtis Mayfield's uh, There's No Place Like America Today. It's like my favorite of his records. And when you realize and see that cover and then listen to the music and you realize, oh, this is the story basically of black people getting on the train from Mississippi and coming to Chicago. And this is what it is that they have inherited. And so for me, it's always very interesting to see now the renderings of that very important period of American history that produced a lot of this country's greatest citizens, but is largely forgotten. But when you really think about it, man, just the emotional idea of what it is that in, like I think about when I go to Europe, that you can catch a two hour flight and go to another country. And in this country, you can catch a six hour flight and still be within it. Like these people really did move to a different country. Yeah, I mean, also there's a privilege with that. You know, I didn't, I never thought about this uh, in this way, because I, I, that I didn't think about that in, in many ways. Um, my grandmother, my, my, grand, my great grandparents were asylum seekers. Um, and being the descendants of these immigrants gave us a privilege that, that, that a lot of their siblings and their children did not. Um, and I think about that because, as, as you know, um, when we, there is, you know, when we, you know, a, a, a growing African American uh, community that is not the descendants of slaves in the United States, and many of them came to these th these lands um, looking for a better life because of either persecution or a lack of opportunity at home. And often that immigrant striving, which I talked about in Harlem, is actually um, also 
embedded in the children gives them those these these greater hopes, these greater opportunities. Thinking a lot about um, uh, Harry Belafonte, you know, you know his family coming from Jamaica to Harlem, and him becoming you know the first platinum selling artist in the country, but also one of the greatest civil rights activists in in the world. Uh, and 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 had his parents not taken that risk, like uh, many of the, the people who took the risks of going, leaving um, the persecution, but also the safety of home in the South to the North, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. And so I, I'm, I'm amazed how all these people come from all of these different places and they have these connections that kind of make them all stronger, if only that they're there to make, with the commitment to make their lives better. New York, skyscrapers and everything, right? Every now and then I do have an occasional skyscrapers and everything moment where I'm here, where I see a descendant of the great migration who is still wearing the same clothes that they were wearing before they came up here. There's a club across the street from my house and I saw one of them checkerboard suits and I was like, ah, yes, we're all the same. <laughs> I'm wondering if Georgia, I'm like, I'm wondering if we, we, we should need to be headed back. <laughs> well, that was the thing when I was in college in Atlanta. Y'all were definitely coming back. Folks were coming down from Freaknik, spent a weekend in town, and they decided they were never going back home. You just cheaper. hated yourself, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was always the thing, is that the New York, when the New Yorkers were coming back, somehow it never dawned on me that their people were ever here in the first place, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, like that context wasn't there, just kind of what this exchange is, you know, back and forth, and in this era now where information is cheaper, travel is cheaper, and so the worlds don't seem nearly as separate, but they really still are in a lot of ways. You know, there's still a, a cultural division in life, like a pop culture division, I think has just kind of gotten blurred, but in life, the division kind of still is there. So like your cousins up North are still your cousins from up North, right? They are, they still kick it different than you do and vice versa. See, I was talking to someone in Berlin though, who was watching Real Housewives of Atlanta and that kind of blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got we got to we got to take a little bit more of a careful note of what exactly we export. Like, I can't imagine what in the world that looks like to somebody with no actual context. Like, because people think the South is just the South, right? Let alone thinking America is just America. They're like, no, 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 that's a very particular window that we're working <laughs> with right there. Yeah. All right, so let's look at there's a couple of pieces that we wanted to look at while we had you here. Now, this one. I want to tell people the story about how you and I uh, were associated very recently when the Phillips uh, collection called me and they asked me to do this with you. And I was like, oh, it's interesting. I was just on a phone call with Hank the other day and we were talking about, um, I wrote a piece for Vanity Fair about college athletes. It was fairly particular to college football and what their kind of struggle is within that setup. And I admit, I was amazed that we were on the phone with you and you had a couple, took a couple of questions, asked a couple of things, said, okay, and then next thing I know, boom, this piece, the Cotton Bowl was there. Now, I did not realize that the Cotton Bowl had already been done. And I was like, wow, you just came back three days later and had this masterpiece ready for us. You are the most amazing person in the world. Um, it's still pretty damn amazing. Don't get me wrong. But I was so struck by this when I first saw it, um, A, because what I was doing, it absolutely fit. But one thing I always find interesting when I see things like this is that in for lack of a better term, the secular world of discussion, nothing scares people more than discussions of anything that's like halfway close to slavery. Like this is more sharecropping, I think, visually than slavery, but it scares people to death. When you get to more, for lack of a better term, literate spaces, you could be more adventurous in the way that you talk about these things and people can handle a reference to slavery without being just terribly and suddenly guilt stricken of, you know, just by hearing the word. But what brought you to the place of deciding that this was the imagery that you wanted to present to make this point? Well, what, I mean, you see the Cotton Bowl image that uh, Jacob Lawrence also created. And I, I didn't um, realize actually until I was at that, around that same time, I was actually doing an internship at the National Museum of American History where they, I, I was a docent, I was showing people how to work the cotton gin and how we would have to, you know, what it was like prior to I think 1792 when it was invented, where you, people had to spend so much of their time trying to pull the seeds out of the cotton, out of the cotton bowls and recognizing how much actual labor, backbreaking labor went into to fueling the economy and building this country. But also I saw an image by a photographer named Danny Lyon of um, people in Angola State Prison picking cotton on the plantation. And to this day, people are picking cotton on the plantation that used to be, that, you know, 
in a prison in a prison and we 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 i think we glorify it when we call it a prison because we could just still call it a plantation it is still slavery is still legal in this country it was never abolished and um many of the descendants of slaves um in the traditional sense uh and antebellum slavery are still doing the same work that their ancestors did and some of the others tens of thousands of the others are um, getting opportunity uh, doing backbreaking labor on some of the same fields that used to also be plantations like Ole Miss, um, where uh, their ancestors also did this backbreaking labor where we're not paid. And, and both of them have a curious connection to the fabric economy. And, and so I, I wanted to make that connection. Um, and I thought about sharecropping being more like college football because you know, as they say, you know, you're still getting an education, you know, if your brain isn't damaged enough. Yeah, no, William C. Roden, uh, formerly the New York Times, works with the undefeated at ESPN, wrote a book called The $40 Million Slaves about professional athletes. And it was, of course, an incredibly provocative title because the idea, how could you be a slave if you make $40 million? And, you know, as I got myself deeper into, and I've, you know, been covering sports now for about 20 years, but especially the more conversations I had with college athletes and everything else is, it was very interesting for me talking to them and hearing some of the guys who could speak to like what the obvious things are that they feel like are advantages, especially in your early 20s or guys like, hey, I got a brand new MacBook. I got the best dorm room on campus. Anytime I need a pair of shoes, I can just walk in there and they'll give me a pair of shoes. You know, I get these sweats and everything else. And I'm hearing that and I'm like, wow, that would sound extra dope if I was like 20 years old. But it also is the share crap, the sharecropping idea that we will give you all kinds of things that contribute to your ability to to add to the bottom line right like they have all the money in the world if it does not go directly into your pocket but if we've got all these other things that we can set you up for it's like oh you need some no tools well it's gonna cost you right You're like that's you know that's kind of where the sharecropping thing comes up and college athletes are in this interesting space i always feel because I think people see them as being fortunate and they go back to like whatever they felt about school. And so they think these are the cool kids and like, oh, I'd love to be cool. I'd love to be the one that everybody knows who we are. But on the other side of this is this giant industry that makes all this money, you know? And so in sports now, it's become interesting that the players are more aware now than they've ever been of what the magnitude is of the economy that surrounds them. Like that's one thing that 2020 did for them when they looked up and they realized that these schools were willing to risk the lives of their players in order to make this money. And they do think that the schools actually care whether or not they live or die. That was when they realized just how significant that this money was and that the risk that they were willing to go through in order to do that. And so when I think about like the sharecroppers and I see something like this, I always wonder about, they, they are certainly aware that there's this macro economy that's around it, but just the understanding of how huge the gap is between them and the people that they are serving. And with the college athletes, because the newspaper prints the salaries of the coaches and everything else, like they kind of know what the money is. They kind of know what the gap of it is, but they don't really get it until they leave with nothing, right? Because most of these guys are never gonna make a dime by playing football or playing basketball. It's like once they leave and they're struggling and hoping to get a job somewhere, anywhere in doing this, and all the people who cared about you when you were playing have suddenly turned their backs, that seems to me to be clear, like when something like this makes sense to them is after the fact. Yeah, well, well also, I mean, it's, we also forget that for so many people, it's as if they had another opportunity. You know, if you were fortunate enough to, to excel at sports and fortunate enough to not get injured and fortunate enough to have people take interest in you and help to develop you and invest in your, in your career through, through high school and, and into college, um, and people did not invest in necessarily other elements of your, yourself where you didn't necessarily excel in other places. You know, how many options are you really being given? And I also recognize that, you know, for African-Americans, we know, I mean, there's so much to say about the beauty of sports and the privilege that college sports created uh, for so many African-Americans that literally brought us to this moment, you know. It's because of um, first the HBCUs, but also of course the Harlem Globetrotters, but it's because of the incredible creativity and the audacity and the hard work of so many 
young black dreamers who saw that they weren't going to be given the opportunity in, in other informal academics. They weren't going to be given the opportunity in formal business, um, but they could maybe uh, try the sport over here. And if they did well in that, they could actually feed the, their, themselves. They could feed their families and then provide opportunities for new people. And thinking about what's happened um, with the integration of sports. I mean, the sad part is seeing how a lot of the incredible HBCU teams are not as strong as they once were. But um, I don't believe a lot of the progress we've, we've had, you know, and think about Title IX, a lot of the progress we've had as a country could couldn't, could have happened if it weren't for those same black players that played for free and took those huge risks. You know, one of the, I was say, one, of, I was say, one of the cruel ironies of this picture is if you ask most football coaches, the dude on the left is the one they want because that's the dude they feel has to fight out of more, right? Like they go like, this is a guy that has no fallback, who has no options. They're taking the guy on the left here over the guy on the right every single time. So like the condition that we're talking about is somehow seen as a positive for the people right. who make decisions. But also thinking about like, I mean, what I, what I realize is what's not spoken, what, what broke my heart about college sports is when I realized they don't even get health insurance for life. <laughs> like literally you could have, and many people have, have, have life altering injuries. They lose their scholarship. They lose their opportunity to work. They lose their, their, their education and no safety net whatsoever. It, 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 you know, and they got a coach who feels bad for them, but just got took home $4 million. The, 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 the university has a $40 million contract for television and then they're, and then they're licensing their likeness <laughs> up until recently for, for to EA sports for free. Right. I mean, and then, and then when somebody said they had to pay for that licensing rather than being like, okay, we'll do it. They're like, Nope. No more video game. Yeah. They're like, we made all of my, like, I, I mean, it was, it was cute when like, they're like, Oh, look, I'm a college Charlie, Charlie Ward playing myself <laughs> on, <laughs> and, you know, on, 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 on EA football. But then you think about it, like, wait, they just made millions of dollars. So, so this, this so this version, this con conversation about modern day slavery isn't just about those who are in prison. There are so many people who are who are still doing free labor, who are exploited in obscene ways. Not talking about like a little bit. I'm talking about tens of millions and billions of dollars ways in perpetuity, <laughs> um, and no one's standing up for them. And so, how do we even begin to talk about justice? And I, and that is where, I, and these are places where we're supposed to be getting education. Right. <laughs> and we can't have that critical dialogue. Right. Now, let's check this next one. This is um, Icarus. Um, and I believe this is displayed in the Phillips collection. And so where did you start with this one? Um, the, this, where did I start with this? I mean, this is first inspired by Matisse. Um, Matisse's paper cuts. One of the things that I, 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 um, you know, he's an incredible French artist, Matisse, a master, as we've been told, and and and, and, and mark that word. Uh, and these are this is one of his masterpieces from his jazz series, uh, and we know where the jazz series was inspired by <laughs> um, African and African American music and culture. Uh, and the piece was Icarus thinking about the boy who, you know, the story of the boy who flew too close to the sun. And, and um, there's that cliche story that we've heard so many times about like this incredible athlete who was doing well in life. And then they went home to visit someone and then wind up getting shot and killed. Or this person who was kind of getting their life right and they were going to do this and do that. And then someone was jealous and they got robbed or shot and killed. Um, and I just saw in this Matisse work that did not, was not made with sports jerseys. It was just a paper cut, a black construction paper or blue construction paper with a little bit of red and yellow. Um, I, I realized that in these so-called masterpieces, there's a lot of opportunity to talk about other things. And um, I also, like to whenever I can point out that the origin of modern art is African art 
uh, that like people like Picasso and Matisse, um, if you look at their artwork before they were introduced to African art, and then almost immediately after, you recognize how quickly their minds were blown and how superior they they believed um, African art was, and it. They, they, they thought it so they thought it was so great that they just decided to make it the center of European thought and uh, representation uh, and um, I think uh, it's important for us to kind of look at it you know bring that those these works back home <laughs> to what really inspired them and and so and then of course looking thinking about the 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 the, the, the basketball teams um, and, and and the jerseys the Lakers, the Clippers, the 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 Knicks and the Pistons, um, there's like a there's like a um, a legacy, you know. I see a little piece of Ewing, you know, Bernard King, and um, these the, the, the names on the on the you know Iverson, the names of the players in the jerseys and the story Jamal, uh, uh, who's that Kareem Abdul Jabbar? No, who's that? Thirty four. A Shaq. Shaquille O'Neal, um, so the, um, but so it's not a Clippers jersey. But there's like there's like another built-in story in each of these um, jerseys that kind of like I don't know they they say something. And also these are the last cities that people migrated to: Detroit, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and and, and New York. Yeah, like Iverson jumped out because it seemed to fit exactly like his story and how close it comes to basically him being the dude in the middle of this instead of being on the sides. His name is one that jumped out immediately when I saw it. Yeah. All right. So we've got the next one, which is We the People. And this one kind of struck me because it's obviously, you know, we got a maze situation here. But like, what brought you to this place and deciding that this is the way you want to approach this? Well, again, I, I, well, this I, I I was looking at. I mean, I, I'm. I cannot believe that we we call we we live in the land of the free. And we brag about it, and we imprison more people than anybody else in the world. It's just dumbfounding to me that 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 the place that is the birthplace of liberty, you know, um, and independence, the Declaration of Independence um, has not in any significant way addressed its original sin or failure in its, in its making. And when in the Constitution, when we say we the people, when it said we the people, <laughs> it did not say, they, they should have had an asterisk that is defined who counted as, a, as, as people at the time. And that would have quickly meant less than 20% of the population <laughs> were, were included in this idea of we the people because no women were, <laughs> you know, obviously no indigenous people were, uh, no African-American men were, and a large portion of, of, of white, quote unquote, or European descended men were not counted as people <laughs> at, this, at the time that this document was written. And I um, found all of these uh, old prison uniforms and I really thought that it would be important to, um, to try to tell a complicated story of the maze of American justice <laughs> um, through, um, through this. And so, um, yeah, it was a pretty powerful work for me and thanks for pointing it out. I mean, still, yeah. Uh, shocking to me yeah like i always think on this that like the idea of we the people is interesting because it was they didn't think it was going to play out the way that it did right like they could just kind of leave it the way it was and they figured that the people that mattered then would be the people who always mattered and so we're kind of trying to retrofit this right like i always say like one of the struggles of marriage in this day and age is we're trying to ret we're trying to take something that was intended to be have one relationship and one set of dynamics and put it in line with what is modern and try to figure out how to reconcile those two things, which seems in large part to be the battle of America. And as we learn, as it goes, like one thing I learned in doing economics was 
if you're doing a model over a time series, you always have to have a variable from where you started because where you started is going to affect wherever it is that you wind up. There's only but so far that you can get away from that initial position that you are in in the sample. And that's kind of where we are, I think, and as we're seeing it right now is the question of how much the people's vote matters is, you know, in dispute. It mm -hmm. comes back to this idea that if that was never the plan in the first place, can that be what we ultimately execute in the end, right? Like my thought when I looked at this and just kind of like looking at it as a bit of a maze or whatever is you're going to wind up being trapped in that maze because the point was never for you to get out of the maze in the way that we talk about. And so, you know, institutionally try to figure out ways to fix that, except the institution was never actually designed to be what the thing is that we are talking about, which then leaves us now like, what well, we gonna do. But, but there are also, there's, and the, you know, there, there are those incredible exceptions, right? You know, um, the Secretary of, Labor, uh, of Housing and Human Development, for instance, you know, Ben Carson figured out his way through, through the maze. And some might say that we figured out our way through, through the maze. And, and so, and people want to highlight the people who might have gotten lucky and been tur turned the right direction or had someone else help them do it, or, or maybe even did it out of their own grit, uh, rather than talking about the larger complexity uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the struggle for liberty in our country. Yeah, and I say in this one, I thought it particularly, you know, we had chosen to go with this one before um, our latest explosion of the world. Because I say before the world blew up, like it doesn't blow up every three weeks. But with like the latest blow up in particular, where really the idea of we the people, it, it feels perilous in a different way at this moment, right, on November the 12th, than I would say that it had previously, just because the, the one thing we say to people can do is vote, right? And now we're just waiting to sign out, you know? Does that still matter? Does that still count? Like it was one thing when he wouldn't let you vote. It's all another thing when they let you vote and didn't say, all right, that, that, that didn't matter. And it does also beg the question of, has this happened before? <laughs> like it's never happened before. I'm like, has it, has it really never happened before? Like we have the luxury of the internet. <laughs> we got like live streaming. We got like, but when they could literally just say it, these votes don't count. <laughs> like. I, I, you know, there's a reason to believe that, you know, almost every election has been stolen. Yeah. So. Well, 1876 is all line one, right? Like that was the one thing about it. When we say whether or not this actually happened, 1876 is always on line one. They're like, fine, you can have the presidency, but it's reconstruction. It's over for you, dog. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's, it's a wrap on that. And then like, I think two days ago was uh, the anniversary, I hate it, that term is probably not the best to use, but um, to the day of the Wilmington uh, massacre, the coup in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, where it was just like, all right, enough of that, enough of that. Like, okay, you guys won this election, enough of that. And then they just took down the statue of the man who led that in Raleigh a year or two ago, or it may have even been this year. They just took the statue down of that you know man. What is, I mean, one of the things that I've been really point, trying to point out about 2020 is, it might be people are talking about their potential being a civil war, but it might also have just been the year that this the the, the second American Revolution, which uh, it was the failed so the, the failed coup in the Civil War, might have just ended this year, right. because if if for over a century after um, the war they were putting up trophies and, and monuments. Um, to celebrate it, um, maybe they, they, you know, the, the North didn't actually win. Um, Robin Kelly said this, the North might have won the war on the battlefield, but the South won the narrative war, you know, when uh, 50, 60 years afterwards, the daughters of the, of, this, of the Confederacy began putting up these, these monuments with all of these complicated systems that make them almost impossible to really uh, completely remove. Yep, and that takes us back 1876 last time it seemed like somebody thought it goes once once you decide to breathe life into something that you could have destroyed you'll never right once that reprieve comes you'll never be able to get it back yeah well uh, say more well i think that once once you had the compromise of 1876 and the south was able to negotiate its way basically out of reconstruction which was the atonement right like one thing we've seen in germany post 1945 was like a legitimate atonement for what had gone on or at least a legitimate attempt at atoning that and a concerted effort to destroy as much as they could anytime the embers started getting warm again 
on that thing. They're like, no, this isn't going to happen. You think about Japan in 1945 after the after the atomic bomb, where it went so far with them. It's like, okay, well, we don't have a military anymore. Like we have decided we are never going to be like this again. Reconstruction to me was the beginning of an attempt to say you will never be like that again. But they would they withstood and endured just enough to where they were able to bring it back in order to give the president like the trade was we'll give you the presidency for this term and you'll only run once and in exchange we back and once they established that they could come back it wasn't going to get shut down and who won the presidency in 1876 rutherford b hayes won the presidency in 1870 he died right no, no, he made it through. He made it through. But the, but the compromise was that the Republicans got to have the White House. And that's why all those reconstructs, all those things about American history, it's American history through 1877 after 1877. Like it's, it's that important in like college courses when people talk about it, that 1877 is this clear line of demarcation and you never talk about it anywhere other than college. And I think I, I had thought about it till now the, the, um, the, uh, that was the centennial year. Yes, I hadn't thought about that till you said it. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> like, it's like so. Yeah, yeah. It's like 18, it's like 1876 turned America into a co 45 commercial. It's like, yeah, things are back to the way they were. Like, like all right, we got to, something feels a little more comfortable now. Let's bring it home. Um, yeah, th- I, I. So, I mean, it's. I'm still stuck on 1860. That's why. I, um, I, I, I was asking about that because, um, you know, I know that we were eight years free, all right? Um, but how did that even happen? Um, how did, uh, there's a jubilation about the reconstruction era that ignores how it was due from the start. Um, not only because racism, but also because of the incredible complexity of uh, the, 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 the infinite quest for um, uh, liberty in our country, you know, that liberty has always been hard fought you know, it took uh, almost 100 years for African-American men to get the right to vote, almost 150 years for white women to get the right to vote. And then they did, they'd done everything. They did, what, another 100 years almost until black women got the right to vote. And they'd done almost everything that they could to keep that, that basic right out of the hands of so many. Um, and the reason I, I go to 1860 is because uh, that that was the year that Abraham Lincoln was elected, and he was elected in larger part than they get credit for because of this uh, grassroots movement called the Wide Awakes, uh, where that sprouted up around a man by the name of Cassius Marcellus Clay, a Kentucky abolitionist. Um, yes, they were related. <laughs> um, who uh, was a threat to the the the, the system because to for to there to be a white, rich, southern farmer speaking about the atrocities of slavery, who'd already um, co-founded uh, Berea College to this day, one of the, the it was which was the first integrated college in, in in the country, but also still one of the only completely free colleges. Um, he was seen as a huge threat. Um, just a few months, so I'm just giving you my little quick history lesson that you, you know already probably, but like, yeah, right after John Brown was killed in, in late 1859, there was a disenchantment for a lot of well-meaning, well-wishing white men who wanted to do right because they understood that slavery was, yes, bad morally, but also was bad for business because you know, you, if you're a working class white person, you can't get a job when a quarter of the population is working for free. Um, and it wasn't just benevolence that, that, that led a lot of people towards abolition. It was actually just basic economics. And these, uh, these people who surrounded Cassius Clay, they were, they were 
torches. They carried torches to protect him and they wore capes and it looked pretty cool. And by October 3rd, 1860, uh, there were over 100,000 by the New York Times numbers, but 500,000 by uh, the Richmond newspapers, uh, um, wide awakes who were um, lighting the torch again for freedom. Um, and they chose a moderate candidate who was not exactly an abolitionist in Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and, and they defined him, they characterized him as their great emancipator liberator. And then after he was elected, kind of made sure he did it. And he paid the ultimate price. And the Wide Awakes basically became a footnote in history. And what I um, was, what I realized is this Messiah concept that we have that cost us the lives of people like Martin Luther King, that cost the lives of people like Malcolm X, and cost the lives of people like Abraham Lincoln is always going to lead us to um, failure because when there is a leader, all, all that has to be do, done is for that person to be undermined or removed and a whole incredible movement can be gone before it's it be ended before it's even really begun. And so we decided through my collaboration for Freedoms that we were going to reawaken that well that the wide awakes have always continued there's been a wide awake continuum that includes the suffragettes includes um the, the harlem renaissance includes the um the uh black power and the civil rights movements includes the women's movement includes the 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 gay rights movement because they are all at the end of the day these collective movements for greater emancipation and uh we and that that is the infinite game Gotcha. We've got the four rules right here for the infinite game. Yeah. So we realized that, yeah, like that, that a finite game is a game for winners and losers, as James Carson described it, that basically it comes in when someone has won. Uh, and an infinite game is a game that's played for the um, purpose of continuing to stay in a state of play. And those, we who believe in freedom are playing an infinite game. And we don't even recognize that we're playing, we're, we're infinite game players stuck in a finite game, whether that be the colonial structures of education, the colonial structures of, of race and gender, the colonial structures of land ownership and, and money that we uh, prescribe to that a lot of us struggle because we don't even understand how to play the game. And even if we do, we are unwilling to because we really realize that none of that will actually give us true liberty. Um, and so we uh, came up with, we were like, okay, if we're going to play this infinite game, how do we come up with rules? And I'd love for you to read rule number one. All right, rule number one, we got no one plays alone. You know nothing you need to know. The rules always change. Love over rules. Rule number two, there are no gatekeepers. Bring people into play. Be where you are and carry your own trash. All right, rule number three, learn from feeling. Let love quiet fear. Nourish joy go there you're just rule number four you're just in time leap before you look you know everything you need to know together we are awake and seriously don't take yourself too seriously play on player play on i'm about to say you ain't gonna take that one from me it's like if i'm gonna if i'm gonna go along with this relay race reading this i'm getting to play all player <laughs> please understand that I like, <laughs> like, and i can't <laughs> say this because you anyway <laughs> uh, you ain't gonna take that from me the other thought i had is you were talking about Cassius marcellus play i would love to take somebody from a time machine from now and drop them off in 18 whatever and introduce them to Cassius marcellus and look at the shock on their face and then no 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 him him no 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 not the guy that's with him yeah, yeah, the white man, right, right there. <laughs> that is, that is, he is the last of the Mar of the white Marcelli that uh, we have come across, at least as far as I can tell. We ain't rolled none of them off the line in quite a while. But thank you so much for this time. I know we've got time to open this up for questions. Absolutely. Uh, some of you may know what I'm doing in this sparkly cape. Some of you I may don't. not. <laughs> Hang <laughs> talk a little bit about the Wide Awakes cape. So just for you all who don't know, we do have a DC chapter of the Wide Awakes. And Hank, I just want to tell you, civic engagement was never my bag until I started to read about the Wide Awakes because I have a real thing for Lincoln. And I had not known about the Wide Awakes before you. So thank you. Uh, check thank out you. DC Wide Awakes on Instagram. Join the... Wide Awakes DMV. 
It is Wide Awake's DMV on Can you show time. us the, your cape, though? Yeah, okay. I got to, I'm going to be a little extra and show you the back. What? Yeah. And, and just tell, tell, see, I don't, Bumani, have you worn a cape yet? He has not worn a cape. I mean, I've worn a James Brown style cape in tribute. I don't feel like that counts. <laughs> well, James Brown was a Wide Awake. Absolutely. <laughs> really? You know? <laughs> And, and the thing is that I didn't realize, like, why do heroes wear capes? I wonder if, it, if part of that comes to that connection to that, that liberation movement. But also, you just, when you put on the cape, when I put on my, my, my superhero name, what's yours again, Erica? I miss Make It Better. Miss Make It Better. It just, it, 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 I embody a different side of myself. I, I, I'm, a, I'm awakened to a different perspective. I can't be hating on people when I'm Mr. Beautiful because I see the beauty and everything. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we've got a ton of questions in the chat and I know we're getting close to the time. So if you two will indulge me one more time and hang out a little longer and anyone yeah. else who can, we're gonna try to get through as many of these as uh, we possibly can. So I'm giving the first question to our esteemed curator, Dr. Adrian Childs. Um, we had a great question that I think a lot of us sort of in this art space have been thinking a lot about. And so Hank, she mentioned that several visitors and you know, obviously myself as well, um, saw the figure in Icarus as the outline of a dead body of a black man. And we, um, we talked about this a lot at the museum and sort of putting um, the body in, you know, stuff we wanted to print out for visitors to use and sort of thinking about the orientation of the body and how should we lay him and, you know, how are people gonna take that? Um, so Adrian's question was, was the chalk outline of the body anywhere in your mind when you did Icarus? And then also, did you have the jerseys custom dyed to that same blue color? No. Um, so that, if you look up um, Matisse Icarus, you'll probably see two different pieces. Uh, and, and one of them is, I think maybe the orientation is different, but it's almost exactly this. And we, uh, I had a, a friend who had a, a, a fascination with college sports and with not actually with just sports jerseys, collected sports jerseys throughout his childhood. And he was just like, hey, uh, I love your work. I have all these sports jerseys. You want to do something with them? I was like, sure. And only over like a course of a few years could I figure out what to do them, with them. But those... I was surprised how many teams have the same colors, you know, and, and, and then, you know, as, as Bomani pointed out, the vintage uh, uh, Lakers jersey that had the, um, that, that was the same color blue as the, as the, the, the Knicks and the, the 76ers. Yeah, I wonder about that blue, kind of like, um, I went to the Neon Museum in Las Vegas where they have all the old signs and they talk about, you know, like why so many, so much signage like for restaurants and stuff like that is that red and yellow, right? Like just, you know, cause the way that it jumps out on there. I was wondering that with sports is like, who realized like, no, this blue, like th this is the one, cause it might be blue and red. Some of those blue and orange, but the, the blue is always the same one on it. Yeah. But, and to the interpretation element of it, one of the things I'm also uh, trying to bring attention to is that when a, a black artist does the exact same thing that a white artist does, there's a very different reading. You know, so when, when Matisse did uh, his, uh, his version, his, his uh, painting, his Icarus painting, that chalk outline thing wasn't there. But of course, because I've, I've been conditioned to see myself as black and embrace every element of black experience, which includes, you know, violence against yeah. uh, gun, gun violence and other forms of violence against black men, um, that I'm like, okay, I see it immediately. But I think that's also our, a lot of our conditioning. I was proud of myself for recognizing that as Matisse, as I'm not as classy as the rest of you guys. I was like, oh, Henri, hey, yeah. there we go. Something and, I know know, something about. And Hank is Henri in French. <laughs> ah, that, there we go. <laughs> we got another question about Icarus from Gregory Luce. Um, Gregory says, um, seeing Icarus reminds him of an observation that he had himself and that a number of the pieces in the exhibition are quilts or draw upon the rich quilting tradition of African-Americans. So we have another quilt by Faith Ringgold in the exhibition, as well as Sanford Biggers, um, two beautiful pieces. Um, so Gregory wanted to know, Hank, how has this tradition, sort of that quilting tradition, influenced your art and your thinking about art? Well, my grandmother and her sisters and my aunt, uh, Yvonne, uh, all quilt, quilted and knit and 
sewed and my mother and her photography work actually made a lot of quilts using kind of fabric that you could print on. And so I think uh, it, it, it's always been part of my, the legacy of the work. I say, I'm like, I'm just doing what my mom already did. This is basic. <laughs> We got another question sort of on the sports angle. So this might be a, this might be on your side, Bomani. Um, so Ellery wanted to know uh, sort of in relation to your Vanity Fair article um, and thinking about unions and strikes attempted by the players in the Big Ten and the Pac-12, do you think they missed the moment by starting the season or is the cat out of the bag and the power dynamics of college football are changing enough that a promising road lies ahead? Um, I do think that they missed the moment. I think that they had a measure of leverage and I think they would have had a level of public support given the circumstances of what was going on in the world that would be very difficult um, for them to duplicate. Now, I don't say that with judgment. And I think that's a very important point to make because I think that we're asking a lot of people ages 18 to 22 who have no backup in this. Like their backup in this is effectively each other. And so one thing I don't think that people realize, and for those who don't know, um, players in the Pac-12 conference this summer, and this actually happened after I had written the Vanity Fair piece. Vanity Fair piece was in and filed and everything before this whole thing caught fire. But the players in the Pac-12 said that they needed a few things to take place before they came back and played because honestly they felt unsafe. It, what made them feel unsafe is that the players were talking to each other about the testing protocols at different schools and the players at schools where the testing protocols were on point quickly realized that was not the case in other places. And so they were like, okay, we are only as safe as the weakest link in this chain. And so if these other schools are doing this, then we're not going to do it. And so the Pac-12 players wanted regular testing, lifetime health care, if they were going to take the risk of doing all these things. But the big one was they wanted a share of the revenue. They wanted to get paid, right? They saw they saw and their advisors saw a connection between civil rights and what was going on with this pandemic, that it was all in fact tied to race. Like they were way ahead of most people in their thinking about the pandemic in the way that it particularly affected African-Americans. Like they, they, they were ahead of the game on that and they were down for it. And then once that happened, the Pac-12 said, oh, well, we'll just won't play this year. How about that? And they cited the pandemic as the reason that they were not going to play. Then all the other conferences decided the Big Ten said that they weren't going to play, but the players in the Big Ten started a movement because they wanted to play, right? There was one thing they wanted to be clear about. They wanted to play under safe circumstances, but they wanted to play and they specifically did not ask for money. And the way that the, uh, the gentleman in the Big Ten that I talked to described it to me was they wanted to work with the conference where the Pac-12 players absolutely viewed this as what it was, which is an antagonistic relationship. Players in the Big Ten were like, no, we can get together and we can figure out how to make this thing work, right? And in the end, the players got what they wanted because there was a season and that really got them there. And so what I learned in the course of this, that's very difficult for any movement involving players, aside from like class and racial dynamics, is the fact that these dudes really, 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 really want to play football. They like they love it. They want to do it. And what they were going to have to sacrifice on top of everything else was they were not going to get to play football. And most of them know that their time to play football is finite. And so they made the decision and the call to come back. Now, there were some individual players who were just like, "Nah, I'm not going to do this. Like I talked to a player for a different piece named Javon Holland at uh, Oregon. And he's probably going to be a first round pick this year. And after the Pac-12 players said what they said, he was the one guy I talked to who said, and if this messes up my NFL career, I know I did something right. Like, like, like he was on that side and he was in that place and he was striding and resolute, resolute about it. And I don't know how this goes if they try to do it again or if a group of players then decides to come back out here. But I even talked to some leaders of this movement and they were just kind of like, I'm a little nervous about this because I do still want to go to the NFL and I'm afraid that the guys in the NFL are going to think that I'm rocking the boat and they don't like guys who rock the boat. And so what it really all came back to is that there's a culture of conformity specifically around football that is different than you have anywhere else. And your voting block, as race is a very important thing in this, your voting block winds up being affected by the white dudes if you are black who have a completely different set of circumstances that surround what they do. So I did think that this was the time that they could make something happen. But I also think that the time to make something happen, it can still come after this. There's, I still think the majority of popular opinion as opposed to players being paid 
but I also still think that there is a greater groundswell for support for those players than there has been five years previous, 10 years previous. And so if something comes up, I think they can still get it done, but I thought that this was as good a time as any to do it. So I'm going to take two more questions because we got a ton and I could listen to y'all talk about this stuff all night. We're going to cut it off. Um, So a really interesting question that came through the chat is for both of you. Um, And I'm just going to read it straight out. As with other art forms where collaboration is preponderant, does Hank envision or engage in efforts that reach out beyond the African-American experience, especially if it potentially adds voice to his work and elevate things more into the public domain, only for more effect and effect? And what does Bomani think about that from his experience in the media space? She has you first. (laughs) <laughs> I, I want to translate it because can, 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 can you summarize it? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the Erica translation. Sort of my interpretation of it was, do you see yourself collaborating with people other than Black people and making works that speak to more than just the African-American experience um, if that adds something to your work and to your voice? I guess the question is, do you think that would add something more to your work or to your voice and then sort of same thing for Bomani in the media space. As I we would talk say, about it. <laughs> uh, if you think that I'm making work that's referencing Matisse and I'm not <laughs> outside of the African-American experience, you might want to Google Matisse and uh, also just my work, you know, I mean, the, the Truth Booth, you know, uh, Four Freedoms, Wide awakes, uh, you know. I mean, I, 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 I'm showing at the Phillips Collection. <laughs> you know, like this is not. Uh, uh, there, there's a there's a limited space in the in the in the mainstream commercial art world for people who are focusing exclusively, or in some might say even primarily on quote unquote African American related issues. Yeah. I work for the mouse. So um, I'm collaborating. People who might not know that Bomani, what the mouse is. Yeah, I work for Disney. So I'll collaborate with white folks at every turn. They ain't really got a whole lot of stuff you can do over there that ain't going to involve some measure collaborating with white folks. But I will say on my end, I do, there are, I don't know, there's some decisions I would say that I make that are calculating to a degree so like, for, for example, with me, I recognize that within the corporate space, like if I'm doing a TV show or a radio show with another black person, and it's just two black people, that thing is immediately black, right? <laughs> like that's what it becomes. It becomes the black thing. And that does affect the way that it is treated, um, whether it be internally at your operation or by people around it. Like once they make that call, they decide that this is a black thing and it's largely I think because they are afraid that white people will look at it and then deem that it is not for them, right? Like they'll immediately off the rip, just be like, okay, now these two black dudes, obviously this is not something that I am supposed to be listening to. Now that- They're plotting plot on Disney. Yes, yeah, yeah, you know, like, but this is, but like, it's a little different. Like, for example, Jesus and Miro, like, their audience is very, very white. And they're, they, for whatever reason, they're able to get in with like a certain set of young people who then jump on and then do it, right? Like it doesn't necessarily expel them, but the suits often see things in that way. And so I know with my work, I do have at times, I people expect so little of us, right? So like, I could say that I've heard of the Beatles, like not even somebody that's obscure, the Beatles, they were like, whoa, I didn't know you were aware of that. Like, yo, I got a TV, of course I'm aware of this. Like, how would I not, you know, how would I not be? I do recognize that some of those linkages can bring people in, right? Like that may be recluse, you know, reluctant or whatever it is to come in, but I'm not doing it to appeal to white people as much as I am doing it to make it obvious to people who can't tell, no, this, like, I, I don't make anything for anybody, right? Like, I'm not explicitly going out here to reach, like, a particular group of people. I'm Black. The experience is going to be Black. Black people are going to be drawn to it, right? But every now and then, I do think that you need to, not need necessarily, but there's a certain value to sometimes letting your audience know it's okay, right? They've been programmed to believe a lot of things in a lot of ways, and I'm not willing to 
capitulate to this madness, but so far, but there are some small compromises that on occasion I am willing to make in the name of accessibility, but it's not going to be something that I don't do already. Right. Like I'm not going to come out here and pretend on this to get you in it. Like there've been some people who have been known to use pop culture references in public to make it seem like they are cooler than they actually are. And you can tell that they don't actually consume the shit that they talk about. Right. That is not going to be me. I talk about Kumo D. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, I yeah, and I just want to say because for me, I think there's um, one of the the things that many of us um, who make work or, or participate in mainstream culture, whatever you call, it, I don't know, <laughs> um, is this perception that we see. Like when I look out, when I'm looking at like I don't see it. I'm looking at myself right now because I'm on Zoom, but I don't see a black person when I like look out when I'm walking down the street you know, people tell me and remind me that I'm black, you know, uh, black people do, uh, white people do, people like there's society does, you know, uh, I think it's really important for us to remember that blackness is a European fantasy. There are no black people. We ain't black, we are clearly brown, right? And the blackness is um, one's relationship to power as described by Europeans. That's why South Asians were black and, and East Asians were black in, in, in England up until like five years ago. And everybody and, could be white, you know, at different points in history. It, well, well, everybody yeah. except. Yeah, but also like all these, most people who like a hundred years ago, most people who are called white today were not white. Absolutely. You know, they, they, they changed their names. They changed the way they spoke. They moved out of their neighborhoods and they became white through uh, one generation of of, of, of of a consuming of a certain version of popular culture that you know that we also watched but we just couldn't couldn't front but a lot of African Americans did as well so I think um, it's really important to to, re to to point out that race is a fabrication it was made so that certain people were literally perceived to be born with superpowers virtues like you know I'm I'm born with you know, Virtue. Yeah, I'm born beautiful. I'm born with virtues. I'm born with, you know, all this opportunity and privilege. Like that's that's a joke. No one's yeah. born with that. And, and and that, but they they've convinced so many of us to believe it that we're still trying to find our way out of it and just see ourselves and others as human beings. Well, I think something that is kind of important on this point. I have complained about this before um, in media and journalism commentary or whatever it is, which is. I am so sick of reading these people's first person essays. I'm so tired of it, right? Like, like the more you have I in your column, the less I'm gonna like it. Cause like my belief is you should be good enough. If you're writing in the New York Times, you should be good enough to write about something other than yourself, right? Like that is my thing. But we have a whole wing right now of work. The whole to be black is da da da. And every time I go outside, somebody's looking at me funny. And I'm not saying these things don't happen. I just don't be looking at them people that much, right? Like I don't really notice these things as much as other people do. Like I do think, especially with younger or the generation, I'm 40. So like the generation that is below me, I think they lean in a lot more on this. And you see these things kind of sort of come up. And I never view my blackness in this context, right? Like I don't think about it. I do not view myself through the lens of others. And I think that we are in a lot of ways indulging and encouraging people, whether we realize it or not, to view ourselves so much through this lens that other people provide and put before us. And I think that it is incredibly problematic that we do that for the reason that Hank is talking about. The stuff's made up, right? Like it is, it is make-believe and you have to lean in on the idea that this stuff is make-believe. And it's not that you should not lean in on and believe in what is good about the culture that you're in and you should not enjoy it and that you should not have a certain measure of pride in it. But I do believe as the question started was whether or not you include these elements of white culture or these, you know, these linking devices in order to get more mainstream support. It almost seems at this point that the way to get white people interested in you is less about throwing in something that involves something that white people do but to go to this, let me tell you what it means to be black place. And I think that whole mode and approach of what we're doing will do more damage than anything else because blackness is then ultimately defined either like by misery and by kind of a set of essentialist tropes 
that actually excludes a lot of people who happen to be black. Like, for example, I grew up in a non-religious home, for example, right? There is an essentialism to these definitions of blackness that people offer that will tell you, because I don't know the words to any of these hymns, that I am thereby less black by definition, because to be black is, right? And you think you, you've you read the, you've read these things that I'm talking about. Ain't none of them fun, right? Like none of them are like, yo, to be black is dope. And it never comes down to that. It's like, you know why? And, and, and you wonder who, which editor picked them then. Yes. And that's and that's and that's where we are. And that, like I say, that's those are the people right now that we need to worry about. Are the people who now look at it and try to find a way to to, to use a very narrow definition of blackness that is externally imposed, and they are using that as their way to get over on white people in this hustle of trying to sell content. Those but, are the people that maybe scared. you made me think that maybe it's an extension of the of, of the slave narrative. You know that like. Yeah. For a period, they were really important, but then at some point, people were like, "Oh, this is how we make money." Yes, go. Well, I, I I also think, and I think you could probably might agree with me on this with your similar background. Best thing my parents ever did for me was the foundation in African history. So the starting point of what Black people are capable of is not defined by what goes on in America. And so if you don't really start with that, right? You know, when people joke about the hoteps and everything else, and there's some problematic elements that come in there, but there's something to be said from starting in a position where this, these are things that Black people did, right? And it does not start from the position of make-believe. That is crucial and people don't get. You know, it's so funny. Like I had my own revelation uh, probably 15 years ago when I started trying, like looking at Black First, you know, because remember there was a period where like, you know, you know <laughs> Black person created, invented peanut butter, you know, Black yeah. person invented, you know, the street light. And I kept, and then there's an argument online. Well, a black person didn't do that. A, you know, a white person did that. All a black person did was this little part over here, which mm -hmm. is why it's still dope. <laughs> and I'm like, and I realized that we are like looking for crumbs of validation mm -hmm. that like we were the first to do it. And it's just like, would I have rather created the first light bulb or the second? <laughs> right. Well, well, also, it was well, it was funny to me when you mentioned Eli Whitney off the top, because I did not realize this. Apparently, there is a generation of people younger than us that somehow were led to believe that Eli Whitney was white. I mean, excuse me, was black. They think Eli yeah, Whitney was they, black. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it would have been a great idea for a black person to figure out how to not have to shuck all this cotton. No, a white man was like, you know how much money I could make if they didn't have to waste all this time shucking this cotton? Yeah, you know, like, like, but you know, like, I'll be honest, like, it's, it would be cool if a black person invented the cotton gin, but I don't need to talk about that in February if it's true. <laughs> so I would love to actually end on that note, but I do have one more question that I want to get to. You got longer I, answers, though. You know that justifies. <laughs> I, I wish I could have a sweater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to justify myself putting on this sparkly cape. So our last question of the evening. I'm so sorry to all of the awesome questions we couldn't get to. But Hank, um, where do you see Four Freedoms going next? And how can folks engage in sort of what your art represents? That's from Darcy Graves. Hello, Darcy Grace. I don't think it's up to me where anything goes. I, I think I, there's also one of the things I struggle with is that like, I'm just a dude. I'm just like a regular person doing regular stuff, stuck on Instagram, trying to figure out how to like do a couple push-ups a day. <laughs> you know, maybe read something every once in a while, you know, brush my teeth. And for some reason, I get way too much credit, you know, where like I'm a small, like as you, as you know, within the context of, of the Wide Awakes, where we, you know, we met through a cl this collaboration where there's probably hundreds or thousands of us. And like, it's, there is no leader. Um, there is like a movement, right? And the goal of these movements is for there not to be a leader because Leaders either get a big head one, a big head, or they get one to the head. And I don't want either, you know. So um, I, I hope that Four Freedoms becomes something that Darcy decides to make her own or our our own. Uh, I definitely hope the Wide Awakes does that. I mean, um, I'm hyper aware now that I'm 44 that I'm moving into that next. TV bracket <laughs> 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 that like may not know what's the hippest, bestest thing, you know? And, and so there's, there's a, um, this, and also in, so there's this need to, to like, I want to be there. I want to, I want to, I don't want to pass the torch, but I want to make sure that we light other torches. And, and so that's what I hope um, many of the work that I, pieces that I'm a part of do, and I just hope they're good. <laughs> 
I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it'll be good. <laughs> so it is, uh, it. mm-hmm. <laughs> it's way past 630 and okay. um, just to sort of respect you all's time and make sure you don't send me a bill for uh, this extra time we're going over because we can't afford y'all. Uh, you, got, <laughs> you got that Disney rate though. <laughs> he does right right look look look, look. Don't, they don't pay everybody like they pay that mouse <laughs> well, wait a minute here's here's the beauty of zoom right because there's no way on earth we could have afforded both of you together physically at the phillips collection so COVID was good for something because this has been um uh, I, I was telling my boss i felt like i was just like listening in on a, a telephone conversation between the two of y'all so um thank you and thank mm-hmm. everyone else for being here with us this evening. Thank um, COVID for taking my rate down. Apparently, that's what <laughs> yeah. I just found out in this. Th- thank Renee and thank Adrian uh, for thank you to the, both of you uh, for your work and um, for for you know presenting my work and me, giving me this opportunity to to speak uh, with this brilliant person who I look forward to collaborating with again um, in the future. No, this is great, man. I really enjoyed this and I appreciate the invitation. Awesome. Um, thank y'all so much. And we hope to see you at the next uh, presentation. Remember, you can check out Risks and Relations on our website at phillipscollection.org. There are some virtual tours. You can see some other talks. They might not be as great as this one, but there's some really good ones uh, on the website. Um, so... With that, have a great evening, everybody, and check out Wide Awakes DMV on Instagram. And at Wide Awakes and at Four Freedoms. Wide Awakes, Four Freedoms, Hank Willis Thomas, uh, Bomani Jones. You can check out all of those IGs.